Yeah, perfect. All right. All right. Well, good to see you, Chuck. All right, good seeing you. Good evening. You're in Colorado, right? Colorado, Lafayette. Nice. Yeah, so, uh, well, I'll tell you what. I'm 66 years old, and uh, I started, there's a whole generation of guitarists who started after they saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan for three consecutive weeks. And I was one of that generation. I uh, saw the Beatles, and I saved my paper route money to buy an electric guitar and an amp. And so I bought electric guitar and amp, started taking lessons, learned to read music. But after about uh, six or nine months, I thought, you know, well, this is great. I know it's very uh, handy to read music, but I don't know how to play what the songs I want to hear. So I went to the neighborhood uh, music store where uh, an unschooled guitarist taught me any song I wanted to learn off the radio. He'd go out and play songs off the radio. And, uh, and I asked him about the fifth or sixth lesson. I said, well, how do you know how to play these? Because... The sheet music in the stores is all wrong. In those days, sheet music had piano and ukulele chords. Yeah. And, and he said, uh, well, here's what you do. You listen for the first note on the record, and then you take it, and you hum that note, and you take the tone arm off, hum it, and you find that on your guitar. Then you make sure that you have that note on your guitar, and you might have to tune the string up or down a little bit to match it. Double check when you're in tune with the record, tune all the other strings, then find one note at a time from the vinyl record, one note at a time. So uh, I took his, I said, okay, so I took his word for it, went home and figured out uh, the uh, solo to Run For Your Life by the Beatles, and I figured out uh, Tax Man, and on Tax Man I had to go down to 16 and two-thirds speed. Old record players had uh, half speed, yeah. so at 16, everything came out an octave low, but at least it came out half as fast. <laughs> Tax Man by the Beatles, and then I figured out, uh, I figured out uh, Crossroads by Cream Live, and so I developed this ability to start popping stuff off records, and that gave, it gave me uh, a good sense of relative pitch. In addition, I went to uh, guitar teachers and learn the basics of music theory and started playing in bands in high school. And in those days, you simply play was uh, on the radio. Nobody had any thoughts to do anything different. And, uh, and then I went through various phases. I became very interested in uh, blues music in my mid-teens. And then from there, got into like Django Reinhardt and Charlie Christian, early nice. jazz stuff. Um, then, I, in my early 20s, I just so happened to live down the street from a guitarist named Bill Frizzell, who is a worldwide recognized uh, jazz trend center right now. He has his own style, and, uh, and he's recorded with everybody, and he's usually cited in the top 10 of current jazz guitarists. Bill taught me the basics of jazz music, that, um, and had me work on book of tunes called The Real Book, and taught me the basics of uh, chord scale relationships and that sort of thing, uh, progressions, and that got me started into, uh, into jazz guitar. And so, uh, meanwhile, while I was studying jazz guitar, I was still, I was still playing top 40 gigs. We'd go out and play songs people heard on the radio, and you'd have to... Uh, after a while, you start to anticipate them. You'd say, oh, we've been asked for such and such several times. We better learn that. Everybody wants to do that. So we do that, and I went along that path for quite a while. Uh, then I took a little diversion in my late 20s into Chapman Stick and spent six intensive years on Chapman Stick. Uh, you can see my album on Spotify right now. It's called Chuck Hughes on Chapman Stick. Okay. Album like on there, and I worked with a drummer and synth trio and did fusion music in those days. Like Chick Corea and uh, Steely Dan and uh, Jimi Hendrix, that sort of stuff. And uh, real book songs, as they're called. Jazz musicians back when I was coming up would get together 
play songs from the real book, and everybody had a real book, and they'd say, okay, straight no chaser. So they, everybody turned to it, and then they'd play straight no chaser. And, uh, and so I, I did that, and uh, just progressed along, playing top 40, and studying jazz guitar. And in 1994, uh, actually in the early 80s, a student brought me in some rockabilly records. And I'd never played rockabilly. I was familiar with it before. I knew it was the Beatles played some rockabilly covers with Carl Perkins in particular. And uh, so I listened to it, and uh, I, I, I had as many as 70 guitar students weekly at one point. And uh, they would bring in stuff and say, show me how to play this, show me how to play that. And I'd get everything from... Sorry, so I didn't catch that. You, th there was a studio asking you to play rockability? Uh, yeah, I had one student who wanted to... Oh, student, okay. Yeah. Student wanted to know how to play some rockability. So I thought, well, this is interesting. I think I'll explore this more. And I thought, okay, I think I'll play uh, rockability for a year. Just do a limited project and see what happens. Well, that rockabilly cover band lasted about 10 years. And in 1994, I said, okay, enough of this. Uh, I didn't get into music to play covers forever. So I sat down and decided to write songs in the rockabilly vein. And I used it very loosely. Some of them would not really be rockabilly, but that was the general definer. So is it, is that when you started recording your own songs, or do, do, were you already writing something? No, that's when you started. Okay. I started writing until 1994, till I was 43 years old, and uh, so I wrote. Uh, I started writing songs. We made a demo tape, and then I uh, and then we. Uh, I was working with a bass player. who was a good upright slap bass player, and we needed a drummer. Could not find one, so we approached the drummer of Reverend Morton Heat who is the premier modern rockabilly band, rockabilly slash psychabilly, and we got that drummer to play on a session for us. And we, he was incredible. We just played half the song for him. He said, okay, okay, let's go. And all the recordings were first, second, or maximum third take. We went out to a physical studio in the state of Kansas. He got to pick the studio. And, uh, and, and he, he wanted a studio where drums sounded good. So he did a fantastic job for us, and uh, those records that I made with uh, with, um, with Taz Bentley, the drummer, can be heard on Spotify today under the band name Hillbilly Hellcats. We have uh, a million and a half streams on Spotify as of today. That's Hillbilly what, sorry? Hillbilly yeah. Hellcats. Hellcats. Hill, Hillbilly Hellcats on Spotify. Cool. Okay. So, uh, and so in any event, so I'm going along playing gigs, you know, making recordings and stuff. And in a band, I would have to say that 95% of your time is eaten up in management management of people and venues. Uh, it is 5% music and 95% management. Yep. So that takes a lot. It, it's, let's just say it's fun when you're there playing and you have a competent band, but to get to that point requires an awful lot of busy work. Okay, so prior to MP3, there was a, I mean, prior to MySpace, there was a band website called mp3.com, and it was band-oriented, and it was fantastic. Every band could put their songs on there and sell them for what they wanted, but what was so great about it was they had all the bands organized according to style and location and rankings in the chart. According, to, So if you wanted to tour, which I did, I uh, you could go to, say, Omaha, look for rockabilly bands and say, we're coming through on June 27th. Would you be interested in sharing a show with us? Would you like an opener? So that was one of the things that helped me uh, start touring. Uh, that I was on MP3. One day, I got a call. Uh, actually, I got an email from a company called PumpAudio.com. Yeah. And we had 40 songs on MP3, and they called and said, 
We would like to license all of your songs for use on TV and movies and whatever. This would be non-exclusive. Would you be interested? And I thought, oh, this, this is some kind of music business scam. But, uh, but I looked at the contract, and uh, the contract looked fine. It did not obligate me in any way. And, uh, and so uh, I said, sure. And in those days, you actually mailed in physical discs. What MP3 did was they took all my tunes, and being a guitar, traditional song format-oriented band, they, uh, almost all the songs have a guitar introduction, a lead guitar solo, and a guitar outro. Mm -hmm. So they lent themselves to quick editing because all the MP3 really wanted, Tom Audio, rather, all Tom Audio wanted was the instrumental sections. So they took out all the guitar solos, intros and ends, and they started pitching them. And about a year and a half later, I started getting 25 and 30 page statements from Pump Audio of all the uses of the songs. So, uh, and along with a check. So I thought, wow, this is great. In 2008, I thought, this is great. I'm on TV, but I'm not getting any songs in movies. And I wonder if there's other companies out there in addition to uh, audio. Well, there were. And just about that time, I, just, I was able to obtain a database of different uh, licensing companies. So I started submitting like a fiend everywhere and uh people ask me today well chuck what three what are the three places you recommend and i say i don't recommend three. i recommend you submit to all of them i agree because, because uh which nobody will you're the only person i've met that agree, agrees with my advice because what i find is that um they are they need what Today's, this morning's client called them up and asked for. And it could be hip hop this morning, it could be Americana next week. It changes very quickly. And so, uh, so I just settled that by going to each company's website, looking at the requirements for submission, and then follow the requirements. I sent them in. And after I sent it, I never gave it another thought. I just went on to the next company. So how many, like, for how long did you do that? Would you say, for example, within in six months you sent like a thousand um, CDs? Or would you have a numbers range or ballpark? Let's see, numbers range. I would say that I have submitted to approximately 300 total in the time I've been submitting. Okay. If I don't do one a day, I uh, I I'll, I get on a um, oh I'll do uh, when I'm in the mood I'll do it for a couple hours mm -hmm. and uh, and then I'll go off and do something else. I don't I tend to do projects better to let's say do something uh, pretty intensively for several weeks and then switch my focus to something else. I've been a member of Toonsat.com since 2011. Toonsat, uh, S-A-T? T-U-N-E-S-A-T yep. dot com. Toonsat listens to, the, uh, to all the TV stations. And uh, what you do is you send your music to them, and they make a computer record of your music, the file that goes in their computer. And when the computer hears your song out on a, t on a TV show... It comes up as a match, and so what? So what? TuneSat does then is it makes a 15-second recording MP3 of, uh, of your song on the TV show, along with the background, along with the dialogue and anything that's going on at that time. It gives you a 15-second MP3. It lists what show you were on and what time it played. I have received. 4,200 detections on Doomsday. They uh, of times when my song played on a TV show. So is that how you got the? Um, you know, you posted a video the other day, 
um, for yeah, uh, Better Call Saul. Is that how you found out your music was playing? No, no how that was that particular one was a fan of the band. Oh yeah, that's right. That was a fan. Yeah. Yeah, fan of the band. He wrote me, saying, "Hey, your songs on uh, Better Call Saul." Cool. And I go, "Wow, I've hit the big time!" And um, of course, as I told in the group then, uh, in order to get paid. Whoever made that commercial with Better Call Saul is supposed to file a cue sheet saying yeah. we use Chuck Hughes' song to send it to the ASCAP. Well, a cue sheet was not filed. And this is common in, in sure. uh, television uses. I imagine there's a, an intern working there for $8 an hour, and it is their job. And the intern is not highly motivated to be accurate. So, um, so in any event, I didn't get paid for that one. And uh, when I see that it's picked up on TuneSat, then I go to my uh, cable TV provider. In my case, it's Xfinity.com. And I have uh, a program. What's the program name I have? Just a second here. It is called ScreenFlow. And I set ScreenFlow uh, to record that program on my TV. Uh, and then after the recording in ScreenFlow is made, I go back and edit the video to just have a video of the 15, 20, or 35 seconds where my song is playing. And that becomes my reel. So rather than to have to say, you should use my music because it would work well, on, on your show and have them be skeptical, I say, well, here's my song on Better Call Saul. Here's another song on um, NTV. So in other words, uh, they can make their own conclusion about whether it's sure. well. That's great. But it, but it then establishes the value. And I've made recordings. I do this on a regular basis, too. I record all my uses on TV shows. In terms of being a live player, I've toured 40 states in the United States in 14 foreign countries, all done through contacts on Google and MySpace and more recently Facebook. And uh, <clears throat> some of the calls to play come from people who got an album of mine 20 years ago, and now they're in a position whereby they're booking a festival. And they say, gee, I wonder if the Hillbilly Hellcats are still together. So they find me on Facebook, send a message, and there you go. So so there's some benefit. Uh, I've heard a person call it advertising equity. Some benefit in keeping the same artist's name for an extended length of time. Yeah. And so, so that's what I've done. Um, Following up, I never follow up ever. And the reason is, I've been to a lot of panels of music supervisors, and almost all of them, at least in the panels I've been to, say, "Don't follow up." I'm yeah. very busy. So actually, what I do in terms of follow up is, um, I'll follow up when I have a negative response. So if I get a negative response, I I ask, um, you know, what are you looking for at the moment? Like, sorry, I took your time. If you have another couple of minutes, um, you know, if you're looking for something in particular, I'd love to help. So that's one way I follow up. Um, otherwise, I follow up more informally, like on Twitter, just to stay in touch. Um, and I limit, like, for music supervisors, I don't, I don't harass them. So I'll follow up once, and then I'll leave it at that for a few months, and then I'll submit something new. Um, it's just, I think following up is a good habit, especially with music libraries, um, because sometimes they just forget about you. For example, indie tracks at, at one point, like they accepted my music and then nothing was happening. It was very weird. And they just had an admin issue where they had uploaded everything. They just forgot to press on a button to make the music live. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm not recommended to harass people at all. But I think if you follow up once, you know, they can deal with it. And if they can't, you know, <laughs> it's fine.
basically, I license what I've already written with the vocals removed. Okay. When I'm doing speeches, I stopped even submitting songs with the vocals. Because the first question they asked was, do you have instrumentals of all these? And it got to be such a regular thing <laughs> that I just didn't even bother with the vocals anymore. And did you record a vocal replacement or not even? Just the instrumental track? Okay. Just vocals removed, that's all. Uh, since almost always it's going to go on top of, I mean, behind dialogue sure. TV. Sure. And now I have had some songs used in movies, the vocal versions, I have. But it's very small percentage, and it's usually someone who is a, uh, a band um, follower, a retail, a retail buyer, a retail music buyer, says, okay, uh, I'm familiar with your works, so I'd like to use such and such song. I get requests like that, occasionally. But those are people who found me in the commercial market, they heard me on iTunes or Spotify. Do you ever write music with licensing in mind, like with licensing as the end goal, or do you just like do you consider more as, as uh, do you consider yourself more as a singer songwriter, or guitarist songwriter, or a composer, you know, not a performer? Basically, was making that distinction, but I guess you've kind of already answered that. Well, I, up until now, I have been a songwriter slash lyricist slash instrumentalist, slash band leader, slash booking agent. <laughs> That's how I functioned in music up till now. Yeah. All I really wanted to be when I was a kid was a lead guitarist. Okay? That's really all I wanted to be is a lead guitarist. I didn't want to sing. I didn't care. I just wanted to play solos. Now, I, I quickly discovered that if you want to work, it's really helpful if you have a band and a PA system and own redundant musical gear and make all the marketing calls. Yep, okay. the new artist model. <laughs> yeah, there you go, the new artist model. I think the secret to having a large, to getting paid in the future for your music on, on a retail basis is to get gigantic Spotify numbers until you build a following. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, um, I mean, I, I really hope it works out for you, but by my calculations, you need uh, a million streams to be paid $3,000. So my view is, unless I become Taylor Swift, I probably won't be making a lot of money with, uh, with Spotify. Do you use a spreadsheet or kind of filing system where where you can see all your catalog, all your songs at once, and know which ones are placed where? No. No, okay. Sounds good, so that answers Ed's question. That's fine. I, that, I'm uh, terrible at keeping track of things, terrible. And I don't, I just, when I'm submitting, I follow the, uh, first of all, I have a small catalog. I only have 37 songs. Okay. So, are, are they all, sorry, are they all on non-exclusive deals? All. All non-exclusive. And uh, two of them are, are, are written to be instrumentals. Okay. For vocals, the rest are vocal songs. The re here, I'll tell you, I did not consciously decide to stop at 37, but I noticed when I was submitting to companies, uh, they wanted at most a dozen and then if they loved you, they wanted a dozen more. And that was it. They're done. And so I thought, well, I have 37. The most they ever want is 24. Write more, but I've already got enough to submit to all the companies around. Also, with 37 songs, I could play four hours in a night. Yeah. Once I got the songs written, my goal became promotional, promotional, to market them, to send them here, there, and everywhere. And you know, I probably should have stopped promoting long ago and started creating more songs. But I just, Not necessarily. I mean, if it's working for you, that's that's really great. It does, it does work for me. That's perfect. I have a list of 50 more libraries that I can submit those songs to, 
and generally they say, send us to an MP3 version on our website, Wizard, mm -hmm. 320K MP3, and if we like you, we'll tell you to submit them all through wave files. Oh. And, uh, or, or submit links, you know. How do you track which libraries you've already submitted to? How do I track? Well, first of all, I have in my email, all I have to do is search the email. And if I want to search, uh, I'm looking at a library, I'll just search my email and say... To check if you've already... Okay. I sent Jingle Pops. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it'll then a list of uh, 15 communications with Jingle Pops will come up. And I said, oh, yeah, I remember now I submitted that. The deal on Jingle Punks was the first time I submitted, I did not get accepted. Mm -hmm. Then I submitted, oh, about six months later, and I got accepted. So, uh, and at that time, they they took, oh, gosh, they took all my songs, I believe, all 37. Awesome. And, and uh, they... Uh, did get me some placements. You know what I do? I go on Facebook. I follow them on Facebook, and every now and then I would reply to what they said. Nice. And after I replied five or ten times, uh, eventually I started getting checks in the mail from them. However, the checks in the mail only lasted a couple of years, and I haven't had anything from them now in three years. I find that I don't know if a library is going to deal with me once or repeatedly. Uh, they sometimes it, it, they just get hot and cold, you know, like Jingle Punks. I don't know if I'll ever hear from them again. I think they have become a lot more restrictive in recent years, and sometimes they weed out the catalog. I believe I looked on my catalog last time I looked in there, and of those 37, they've thrown out eight or nine. So, um, so they're still there. I don't worry too much about any one place, though. Try, try to figure out what's going on. I don't worry about it. Um, either they will or they won't. Yeah. And don't and don't call me. I don't. I don't want to write for hire either. Okay. Yeah. So you've never written for hire. Nope. I'll tell you what I what I and I'll tell you why. It probably goes back to my early days as a top 40 musician, having to learn music that the people wanted to hear. And I had taste that that left in my mouth. Uh, but transferring that idea to writing, just for the heck of it, I tried writing some stuff according to what people said they want. Mm -hmm. And this was through Taxi, uh, where they say, okay, we're looking for this, that, and the other thing. And I thought, okay, I'm going to challenge myself just to see if I can follow directions and come up with something. So I did that for several listings on Taxi, and I also did it at Reverb Nation. I remember one, they said, okay, who wants something like this, like Mumford and & Sons? And I thought, okay, I can do that. I'll change the chord progression a little bit. I'll use the same instruments. Uh, let's see, I'll put some banjo on it. And, and then at the end, I thought, that's pretty good. Okay, never got, that was not accepted. I did about five for Reverb Nation that were not accepted. The last one I did was two years ago. The established rockabilly band asked me to record a solo track. I recorded it, and I thought, wow, I, I, I did a good job on this one. I did a good job. They wrote me back and said, could you completely redo it and do it like Ryan Setzer? And I said, well, I have no idea how Brian Setzer would do this. But I, but, and I told them before I did it, I said, I'll do the track for you, the $100, but I'm only going to do it once. $100, only do it once. What I won't do is just back and forth. Can you change this? Can you take the 13th measure and sort of do this to it? I'm not interested in that. I'll do it once. And, and, uh, and so I had one track came across was successful like that, the next time they asked me to completely redo it, and I said, here, I'm sending your money back to the PayPal. Um, I'm not going to do it again, and if you don't like it, that's okay. That's the 
problem that I see in writing for hire. That what are you going to do about regions? I just got asked to be a studio guitarist four months ago, and uh, they said we would like you to work for our studio. You know, lay guitar parts down for the singer songwriters and that sort of thing. And I said, and I said, no, I'm not going to do it. You know why? Because of the region. Um, if they ask me to play something, I play it, and I get paid. And I quoted them money ahead of time. Okay, the person is not satisfied. Here are their choices then. So just to cut the music that they're not satisfied with and say that's the way it worked out, or to ask me to do it again and to pay me again, or to ask me to do it again and not pay me. On the assumption that uh, I'm working on a satisfaction guaranteed basis. Well, I don't work on a satisfaction guaranteed basis. I work on a best effort basis. I promise you my best effort and that's all. But you know what? In my opinion, that's not good enough for people. Even if you tell them, I'm only going to do it once and this is what you get, uh, they still think that when it's all done, that you should respond, redo it to their specifications. Bands get asked to play for free all the time. Yeah, yeah. And my response to when I get asked to play a benefit now, I have a response that goes like this. I say, we will consider playing for free if absolutely no one there is getting paid. Yeah. Is the venue clear? That's a great... Yeah. The waitresses, the sound people, the bartender, uh, the drinks. Are the drinks free? Drinks need to be free, too. Um, I, so we will be free as long as no one is getting paid. And how many libraries do you have your tracks? Oh my gosh. I would say probably uh, somewhere around 30. I would say around 30. Okay. So that'd be about, sorry. Yeah. Not accepted. Okay, in terms of keeping track, uh, they send Schedule A and the contract. I sign it, sign it off, and then I print it, hard copy on a printer. Yeah. Then I put it in a file box, uh, in a file box, um, and if I ever have to look to find that information, well, what did I submit to so-and-so company? I can find it in the box. Sure. But I find myself rarely having to ever no, sure. uh, answer that question. I, I, the only time I have myself answering that question is that uh, when they say, that was great, can you submit some more? And I say, sure. Then I need to go to the Schedule A in the file box and say, okay, what did I submit to those guys? Okay. All right. And then I pick tunes that I haven't already submitted. But I don't have to do that very often because most people are satisfied with the initial tune as well. Perfect. So you managed to make a, a living with um, so with thirty music li about thirty music libraries who have between ten and twenty four of your tracks each. That's that's right. that's really cool. And to, and to get to that standpoint, though, I had to submit to about three hundred. So that's about a ten percent. Um, you know, that's that's good. You know, and that I think that's really important to to tell people as well because people might get discouraged. When they don't get accepted by the first few, or don't hear anything back from the first, you know, ten or twenty, it's actually the, the, you know, you're a very experienced musician, and still you get, you know, you get only ten percent. Ten percent is actually a really good, uh, a really good uh, ratio, I'd say. So cool. You you mentioned you had uh, about four thousand detections with a tune set. All of those are through music libraries. You're not in touch with music supervisors, or have you had music supervisors um, I, place one of your songs? I did. I had a music supervisor for MTV do direct licenses with me, and it was one of the best deals I've ever had. Cool. And it was an MTV show called Ridiculousness. <laughs> all my Sounds like MTV. <laughs> almost all my uses are for dumb reality shows. Yeah. I hear you. Yeah, dumb reality shows. <laughs> Love me. Same here.
um, it, it, here's how it happened. I was in, uh, I was a member of Reverb Nation. By the way, I've been a member of just about every, every place that says, we'll get your songs on TV. I have been a member for at least one year. And, uh, and it populated it with my songs and hoping I would get picked. Um, and uh, I was on Reverb Nation in 2011, and they wrote me and they said, Hey, Chuck, we've got a uh, music supervisor. We can't find any indie rockabilly. Uh, we, we're just going to give you his name and number and let you contact him. Hello. And I contacted him. And he said, yeah, he says, uh, send me over, I don't remember if he wanted, uh, I, I think in this case, he just wanted me to pick 20 of what I thought were my best tunes, or the generally get. 20, wow, well, that's a lot. <laughs> um, the reason is, I'm in a very narrow niche, rockability, yep. rockability slash psychability. Um, you know, if you say you're alternative, you play alternative rock, well, it's kind of nebulous. And, uh, and, but if you say you're rockabilly, psychabilly, people have a vague impression. And a lot of rockabilly bands are not very computer or internet savvy. They, um, they would not be into the idea of sending your songs into libraries for licensing consideration. They yeah. want to go out and play live and get paid. That's really all they want to do. And so I'm in a niche, and that particular niche is not generally that technologically oriented. So that gives me an advantage. Um, it's, it's um, I think, tedious work submitting to libraries. And Audio Sparks is the worst. It's it's really heavy, but I chose that example in the course because I think it's like if you get Audio Sparks, you get everything. Like if you have all the inform, if you know how to do it with Audio Sparks, you're set for the rest because they ask for so much information. Agreed. As a matter of fact, when I first submitted to them, I populated some of the um, forms rather sparsely, like <laughs> one thing down, you know, and categorize some. And they contacted me and yelled at me. <laughs> Here's what you need to do. Do this, 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 this. I said, okay. And I think you said you could get through a song in 10 minutes. Gosh, I think it could be 30 to 40 per song. The reason, the reason I could do that is that, you know, I have my catalog tracker so I can copy paste. And I have my keywords so I can just... I just... I do it once for... But my catalog is so huge I have to do that because... It's a nightmare otherwise. Good for you. That's great. As a matter of fact, I did use the audio sparks to fill out uh, the new library. When, mm -hmm. when you know, sometimes you have to select words that they have already yeah. chosen. Yeah. You tell us which of these 30 moods. You pick 10 of these 30 moods. Tell us what uh, describes your song. Other times, it's just a blank slate. You get to put in whatever you want. And I do go back to the categories on audio smarts to do that. I mean, yeah. But, uh, like music licensing is very competitive, but the way I see it is you have thousands of musicians who want to do it, then you have, you still have thousands who are going to try to do it, but as soon as you, like, as soon as you persevere for, say, like six months or one year, there are only tens of thousands left. And then if you have a good niche, then suddenly it's just a few thousand. And little by little, it's actually, you know, I mean, it is competitive. There are a lot of really talented musicians out there who are seeking the same opportunities as, as we are. But, you know, if you persevere and, and you focus on it, not necessarily every day, but, you know, if your technique is fine of batching as well, I, I, I tend to I tend to do that as well um, while I juggle several projects, but um, it's doable. It's completely doable, and I think you're a great example because 37. You know, I've always aimed for a large catalog because my first mentor uh, did it that way. But 
you know, 37 uh, songs and uh, with 30 libraries and, and you're doing good. So that's, that's proof that it can be done. Yeah, you know, your system, though, uh, whenever you go to the taxi convention, they they have the uh, taxi poster children to get up on the panels there and talk about what they've done. And this is the theme that they, that they say. They say, in general, you're going to need 1,000 to 2,000 yes. people out there working for you. They don't go to try to hit the home run. They look... They, they seek to make a living through um, a lot of single placements, or what what some what I heard one uh, planner uh, one panelist call a river of nickels. You're, they're only getting sometimes a few dollars for a placement, sometimes a couple hundred. The most I've ever received for a placement is two thousand dollars up, up front, and I've received that twice, two thousand. The least I've received is one cent. That's the, the theme. They have composers who work quickly and they make a lot of stuff. Um, you know, they, Maxi likes to say, if you could make three pieces of music a week, you'd have 150 new ones in a year. Yeah. 150 new ones in a year, in five years, you'd have 750. You'd be well on your way to this goal of 1,000 to 2,000 pieces of music working for you. I'm focusing a lot on keywords and descriptions because I think if you can get the keywords right and come up in, at the top of search results and then have a really good description that catches the potential customer's eyes, I think that's something that's uh, that people don't look at as much as they should because having a, you know having your your song come up first or you know in the first ten and a really good description. Um, either shocking or funny, but something that catches the attention of, of the potential customer, that's really, really important and overlooked. So I think the yeah, if you can do both, if you can create a lot and 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 get keywords right, you're pretty much golden. But you know, your story is also the proof that you don't need to be a serial composer. Uh, I do it because I really like the challenge. I just find it fun to. Because like my brain goes into really weird places, and you know, because I write so much, I have to come up with new weird ideas, and I really enjoy that. But there are a lot of you know singer songwriters who aren't as prolific, or maybe the studio costs are too expensive, and it's great that they can hear that it works for you. People usually the question people usually ask me is, what three would I recommend? Yeah. Because they don't want to go through a lot of this. <laughs> and I say, the three that work for me might not work for you. Exactly. Back, back in the senior salesman would knock on the door, and they knew that if they contacted 300 houses, one of them would buy a vacuum that day. Exactly. Which, which of those 300 houses was the right one? Yep. So that's, and I'm afraid that for me, that's how the music licensing is too. Thanks a lot for your time. I really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy the program. I'll talk to you soon, and uh, I'll see you in the group. Okay, bye-bye. Cool, bye.